Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome back for the second time this evening to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books. Sorry about that. This is Sunday and it's a bank holiday and we're right next to the uh, channel, English channel. So we had some problems with our connection. We've changed to our plan B, uh, you know, uh, line, our internet connection, and it seems to be okay. So let us go on. Uh, as I was saying, uh, <clears throat> this is the holy day of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's appearance, and he was really attached to Chaitanya Charitamrita, but he had a hard time finding a copy. Try to understand. In Bengal, in Arissa, he had a hard time finding a copy, a published copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. That's how far the movement of Lord Chaitanya had di disintegrated uh, after his passing away. This is, should be a great lesson to us because as powerful as an Acharya is, our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, still from time to time, the time factor wears away whatever is there. Even when Lord Chaitanya was there, he started it up and it was, as we've been reading, uh, uh, vigorously spread and uh, powerful by the time Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left. But still over time, it became, uh, it dissipated. So then Bhaktivinoda Thakur couldn't find. But when he did find the copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita, he was already going in that direction of reawakening his original Krishna consciousness. And that's when his stature, his spiritual stature, manifested itself. And he became the single-handed uh, responsible for single-handedly responsible for reawakening, uh, re-establishing the real teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it, it manifested itself, or it came together when he found the Chaitanya Charitamrita. The second time through, he realized that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Krishna and that this, his movement was meant to spread uh, love of God around the world. So, and he passed on that attachment to his son, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who made this comment about Sri Chaitanya Turitamrita, this beautiful, poetic uh, glorification. He said, in due course, Mahapralaya, devastating floods, will inundate the entire universe. If you attempt to survive by swimming in that deluge, then do not neglect to take hold of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. If you cannot hold all three, then release Bhagavad Gita. If necessary, you may also relinquish Srimad Bhagavatam, but under no circumstances release your hold on Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. For if this one book remains, then the flood can do no actual damage, because after it is subsided, the message of Shastra can be revived from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita alone, it being the essence of all Shastra. Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Dvaita Chandra Jai Gorda Bhaktivinda Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Dvaita Chandra Jai Gorda Bhaktivinda Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vinda Okay, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is touring South India and meeting all kinds of wonderful personalities, preaching up a storm, converting everyone to pure Krishna consciousness, Vaishnavism. Uh, we just heard the summary contents in the purport, in the last purport of the Brahma Sangita, which he, he found 
in the Adi Keshava temple in South India. So we're beginning chapter 9, Madhulila Chaitanya Charitamrita, at text 241. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu copied the Brahma Sangita and then with great pleasure he went to a place known as Ananta Padmanabha. Purport. Concerning Ananta Padmanabha, one should refer to Madhulila, chapter 1, text 115. Text 242. <clears throat> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu remained for two or three days at Ananta Padmanabha and visited the temple there. Then, in great ecstasy, he went to see the temple of Sri Janardana. Purport The temple of Sri Janardana is situated 26 miles north of Trivandrum, near the Varkala railway station. Text 243 Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu danced and chanted, chanted and danced at Sri Janardana for two days. Then he went to the bank of the Payaswini River and visited the temple of Shankar Narayana. Then he saw the monastery known as Sringeri Mat, the headquarters of Acharya Shankar. He then visited Matyatirtha, a place of pilgrimage, and took a bath in the river Tungabhadra. Purport. The monastery known as Sringeri Mat is situated in the state of Karnataka in the district of Chikmalagur. Uh, Chikmalagur. This monastery is located at the confluence of the rivers Tunga and Bhadra. Seven miles north, or seven miles south of Hariharapur. The real name of this place is Sringa Giri or Sringa Verapuri, and it is the headquarters of Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya had four principal disciples, and he established four centers under their management. In North India, at Badarikashram, the monastery named Jyotirmat was established. At Purushottam, the Bhogavardhana or Govardhan monastery was established. In Dwarka, the Sarada monastery was established. And the fourth monastery established in South India is known as Sringeri Mat. In the Sringeri Mat, the sannyasis assume the designations Saraswati, Bharati, and Puri. They are all Ekadandi sannyasis distinguished from the Vaishnava sannyasis who were known as Tridandi sannyasis. The Sringeri Mat is situated in South India in a portion of the country comprising Andhra, Dravida, Karnata and Kerala. The community is called Buri, Buribara and the dynasty is called Bur Bhuva. The place is called Rameshwar and the slogan is Aham Brahmasmi. The deity is Lord Varaha, and the energetic power is Kamakshi. The Acharya is Hastamalaka. And the Brahmacharya assistants of the sannyasis are known as Chaitanya. The place of pilgrimage is called Tungabhadra, and the subject for Vedic study is the Yajur Veda. The list of the disciplic succession from Shankaracharya is available and the names of the Acharyas and the dates of their accepting sannyas according to the Shaka era or Shakabda are as follows. For approximate Christian era dates add 78 years. Shankaracharya 622 Shaka Sureshvaracharya 730 Bodhanacharya 680 Gyanadanacharya 768 Gyanotama Shivacharya 827 Gyanagiri Acharya 871 Sengagiri Acharya 958 Ishwara Tirtha 
1019, Narasimha Tirtha, 1067, Vidya Tirtha, Vidya Shankar, Vidya Tirtha, Vidya Shankar, 1150, Bharati Krishna Tirtha, 1250, Vidyar, uh, Vidyaranya Bharati, 1253, Chandrasekhar Bharati, 1290, Narasimha Bharati, 1309, Purushottam Bharati, 1328, Shankarananda, 1350, Chandrasekhar Bharati, 1371, Narasimha Bharati, 1386, Purushottam Bharati, 1398, Ramachandra Bharati, 1430, Narasimha Bharati, 1479, Narasimha Bharati, 1485, Dhanamadi Narasimha Bharati, 1498, Abhinava Narasimha Bharati, 1521, Sachidananda Bharati, 1544, Narasimha Bharati, 1585, Sachidananda Bharati, 1627, Abhinava Sachidananda Bharati, 1663, Nishinga Bharati, 1689, Sachidanan Sachidananda Bharati, 1692, Abhinava Sachidananda Bharati, 1730, Narasimha Bharati, 1739, Sachidananda Shiva Bhinava Vidya Narasimha Bharati 1788 Regarding Shankaracharya it is understood that he was born in the year 608 of the Shakabda era in the month of Vaishaka on the third day of the waxy moon in a place in South India known as Kaladi His father's name was Shivaguru and he lost his father at an early age. When Shankaracharya was only eight years old, he completed his study of all scriptures and took sannyas from Govinda, who was residing on the banks of the Narmada. After accepting sannyas, Shankaracharya stayed with his spiritual master for some, t some days. He then took his permission to go to Varanasi, and from there he went to Bhadrik Ashram, where he stayed until his twelfth year. While there, he wrote a commentary on the Brahma Sutra as well as on ten Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. He also wrote Sanat Sunjatiya and a commentary on the Nushinga Tapani. Among his many disciples, his four chief disciples are Padmapada, Shureshwara, Hastamalaka, and Trakota. Trokata. After departing from Varanasi, Varanasi, Shankaracharya went to Prayag, where he met a great learned scholar named Kumarila Bhatta. Shankaracharya wanted to discuss the authority of the scriptures, but Kumarila Bhatta, being on his deathbed, sent him to his disciple, Mandana, in the city of Mahishmati. It was there that Shankaracharya defeated Mandana Mishra, in a discussion of the Shastras. Madana had a wife named Saraswati, or Ubhaya Bharati, who served as mediator between Shankaracharya and her husband. It is said that she wanted to discuss erotic principles and amorous love with Shankaracharya, but Shankaracharya had been a brahmachari since birth and therefore had no experience in amorous love. He took a month's leave from Ubhaya Bharati and by his mystic power entered the body of a king who had just died. In this way Shankaracharya experienced the erotic principles. After attaining this experience, he wanted to discuss erotic principles with Ubhaya Bharati, but without hearing his discussion, she blessed him and assured the continuous existence of the Shingari Mat. She then took leave of material life. Afterwards, Madana Mishra took the order of sannyas from Shankaracharya and became known as Sureshwar. Shankaracharya defeated many scholars throughout India and converted them to his Mayavad philosophy. 
He left his material body at the age of 33. As far as Matyatirtha is concerned, it was, it was supposedly situated beside the ocean in the district of Malabar. Text 245. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu next arrived at Udupi, the place of Madhvacharya, where the philosophers known as Tattvavadis resided. There he saw the deity of Lord Krishna and became mad with ecstasy. Purport. <clears throat> Shripad Madhvacharya took his birth near Udupi, which is situated in the South Kanara district of South India, just west of Sayadri. This is the chief city of the South Kanara province and is near the city of Mangalore, which is situated to the south of Udupi. Near the city of Udupi is a place called Pajakachetra, where Madhvacharya took his birth in a Shivali Brahmana dynasty as the son of Madgai, uh, Madhyageha Bhatta in the year 1040 Shakabda, A.D. 1118. According to some, he was born in the year 1160 Shakabda, A.D. 1238. In his childhood, Madhvacharya was known as Vasudeva, and there are some wonderful st stories surrounding him. It is said that once when his father had piled up many debts, Madhvacharya converted tamarind seeds into actual coins and paid them off. When he was five years old, he was offered the sacred thread. A demon named Maniman lived near his abode in the form of a snake. And at the age of five, Madhvacharya killed that snake with the toe of his left foot. When his mother was very much disturbed, he would appear before her in one jump. He was a great scholar, even in childhood, and although his father did not agree, he accepted sannyas at the age of twelve. Upon receiving sannyas from Achutya Preksha, he received the name Purnapragya Tirtha. After traveling all over India, he finally discussed scriptures with Vidyashankar, the exalted leader of the Sringeri Mat. Vidyashankar was actually diminished in the presence of Madhvacharya. Accompanied by Satchatirtha, Madhvacharya went to Badarikashram. It was there that he met Vyasadeva and explained his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita before him. Thus he became a great scholar by studying before Vyasadeva. At the time he came to Anandamat, by the time he came to the Anandamat, from Badrikashram, Madhvacharya had finished his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. His companion, Satyatirtha, wrote down the entire commentary. When Madhvacharya returned from Badrikashram, he went to Ganjama, which is on the bank of the river Godavari. There he met with two learned scholars named Shobhanabhata and Swami Shastri. Later, these scholars became known as in the disciplic succession of Madhva, Madhvacharya as Padma Tirtha, Padmanabha Tirtha, and Narahari Tirtha. When he returned to Udupi, Udupi, he would sometimes bathe in the ocean. On, on such an occasion, he composed a prayer in five chapters. Once, while sitting beside the sea, engrossed in meditation upon Lord Sri Krishna, he saw that a large boat containing goods for Dwaraka was in danger. He gave some signs by which the boat could approach the shore, and it was saved. The owners of the boat wanted to give him a present, and at the time Madhvacharya agreed to take some Gopichandan. He received a big lump of Gopichandan, and as it was being brought to him, it broke apart and revealed a large deity of Lord Krishna. The deity had a stick in one hand and a lump of food in the other. As soon as Madhvacharya received the deity of Krishna, in this way, he composed a prayer. The deity was so heavy 
that not even 30 people could lift it. Yet Madhvacharya personally brought this deity to Udupi. Eight of Madhvacharya's sannyas disciples became directors of his eight monasteries. Worship of Lord, the Lord Krishna de deity is still going on at Udupi according to the plans Madhvacharya established. <clears throat> Madhvacharya then for the second time visited Badarikashram. While he was passing through Maharashtra, the local king was digging a big lake for the public benefit. As Madhvacharya passed through that area with his disciples, he was, he was also obliged to help in the excavation. After some time, when Madhvacharya visited the king, he engaged that, the king in that work and departed with his disciples. Often, in the province of Ganga Pradesh, there were fights between Hindus and Muslims. The Hindus were on one bank of the river and the Muslims on the other. Due to the community tension, no boat was available for crossing the river. The Muslim soldiers were always stopping passengers on the other side. But Madhvacharya did not care for these soldiers. He crossed the river anyway, and when he met the soldiers on the other side, he was brought before the king. The Muslim king was so pleased with him that he wanted to give him a kingdom and some money, but Madhvacharya refused. While walking on the road, he was attacked by some dacoits, but by his bodily strength, he killed them all. When his companion Satyatirtha was attacked by a tiger, Madhvacharya separated them by virtue of his great strength. When he met Vyasadev, he received from him the Shaligram Shila known as Ashtamurti. After this, he summarized the Mahabharata. Madhvacharya's devotion to the Lord and his erudite scholarship became known throughout India. Consequently, the owners of the Shingeri Mat, established by Shankaracharya, became a little perturbed. At that time, the followers of Shankaracharya were afraid of Madhvacharya's rising power, and they began to tease Madhvacharya's disciples in many ways. There was even an attempt to prove that the disciplic succession of Madhvacharya was not in line with Vedic principles. A person named Pundarik Puri, a follower of the, of the Mayavad philosophy of Shankaracharya, came before Madhvacharya to discuss the Shastras. It is said that all of Madhvacharya's books were taken away, but later they were found with the help of King Jayasinga, ruler of Kumla. In discussion, Pundarik Puri was defeated by Madhvacharya. A great personality named Trivikramacharya, who was a resident of Vishnu Mangala, became Madhvacharya's disciple, and his son later became Narayanacharya, the composer of Sri Madhvabijai. After the death of Tri Trivikramacharya, the younger brother of Narayana Acharya took sannyas and later became known as Vishnu Tirtha. It was reputed that there was no limit to the bodily strength of Purnapragya Madhvacharya. There was a person named Kadanjari who was, who was famed for possessing the strength of 30 men. Madhvacharya placed the big toe of his foot upon the ground and asked the man to separate it from the ground. But the great strong man could not do so even after great effort. Srila Madhvacharya passed from this material world at the age of 80 while writing a commentary on the Aitareya Upanishad. For further information about Madhvacharya, one should read Madhva Bijai by Narayana Acharya. The Acharyas of the Madhva Sampradaya established Udupi as the chief center and the monastery there was known as Uttaradi Mat. 
a list of the different centers of the Madhvacharya Sampradaya can be found at Udupi. And their Mat commanders are 1. Vishnu Tirtha, Shodamat, 2. Janarda, Janardan Tirtha, Krishnapur Mat, 3. Vamana Tirtha, Kanura Mat, 4. Narasinga Tirtha, Adamala Mat, 5. Upendra Tirtha, Putugi Mat, 6. Rama Tirtha, Shirura Mat, 7. Rishikesh Tirtha, Palimara Mat, and 8. Ashokbya, Ak Akshobhya Tirtha, Peja Dwara Mat. The disciplic succession of the Madhvacharya Sampradaya is as follows. The dates are those of birth in the Shakabda era. For Christian era dates, add 78 years. 1. Hangsa Paramatma. 2. Chatur Mukha Brahma. 3. Sanakadi. 4. Durvasa. 5. Gyananidi. 6. Garuda Vahana. 7. Kaivalya Tirtha. 8. Ganesha Tirtha. 9. Para Tirtha. 10. Satya Pragya Tirtha. 11. Pragya Tirtha. 12. Achutya Prekshacharya. Achutta Prekchacharya Tirtha. <clears throat> 13. Sri Madhvacharya. 1008. Shaka. 14. Padmanabha. 1120. Narahari. 1127. Madhava. 1136. And Akshobhya. 1159. 15. Jaya Tirtha. 1167. 16. Vidyadi Raj, Vidyadi Raj, eleven ninety, seventeen, Kavindra, twelve fifty five, eighteen, Vagisha, twelve sixty one, nineteen, Ramachandra, twelve sixty nine, twenty, Vidyanidi, twelve ninety eight, twenty one, Sri Ragana, Raganath. 1366, 22, Rayuvarya, who spoke with Sri Titanya Mahaprabhu, 1424, 23, Raguttama, 1471, 24, Vedabhyas, 1517, Vidyadesha, 1541, 26, Vedanidi, 1553, 27, Satyabrata, 1557, 28, Satyanidhi, 1560, 29, Satyanath, 1582, 30, Satyabhinava, 1595, 31, Satyapurna, 1628, 32, Satyavijaya, 1648, 33, Satyapriya, 1659, 34, Satyabodha, 1666, 35, Satya, Satya Sanda, 1705, 36, Satyavara, 1716, 37, Satya Dharma, 1719, 38, Satya Sankalpa, 1752, 39, Satya Santushta, 1763, 40, Satya Parayana, 1763, 74, Satya Kama, 1785, 42, Satya Satyeshta, 1793, 43, Satya Parakrama, 1794, 44, Satya Diri, Satya Dira, 1801, 45, Satya Dira Tirtha, 1808. After the 16th Acharya, Vidyadiraj Tirtha, there was another disciplic succession, including Rajendra Tirtha, 1254, Vijayadwaj, Purushottama, 
Subra Subramanya and Vyasaroy, 1470 through 1520. The 19th Acharya, Ramachandra Tirtha, had another disciplic succession, including Vibhudendra, 1218, Jitamrita, 1348, Raghunandana, Surendra, Vijendra, Sudindra, and Raghavendra Tirtha, 1545. To date, in the Udupi Monastery, there are another 14 Madhva Tirtha sannyasis. As stated, Udupi is situated beside the sea in South Kanara, about 36 miles north of Mangalore. Most of the information in this purport is available from the South Kannada Manual in the Bombay Gazette. <laughs> so we're getting the real news here, getting the real news of our <clears throat> forefathers. <clears throat> Text 246. <clears throat> While at the Udupi Monastery, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw a dancing Gopal, a most beautiful deity. This deity appeared to, to Madhvacharya in a dream. 247. <clears throat> Madhvacharya had somehow or other acquired the, de the deity of Krishna from a heap of Gopi Chandan that had been transported in a boat. Text 248. Madhvacharya brought this dancing Gopal deity to Udupi and installed him in the temple. To date, the followers of Madhvacharya, known as Tatvabadis, worship this deity. Text 249. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu received great pleasure in seeing this beautiful form of Gopal for a long time. He danced and chanted in ecstatic love. Text 250. Yeah, actually. Do they hear me talking about Shichiki Who knows? I don't know. It's still going. I think it paused. So. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, your t tolerance today. There's been so many interruptions call from my best friend and dear one, Vaisheshika Prabhu, and uh, he thought that somehow or other we started a little later or that it would be finished. So, uh, we're at text 250. When the Tattvavadi Vaishnavas first saw Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they considered him a Mayavadi sannyasi. Therefore, they did not talk to him. Text 251. Later, after seeing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in ecstatic love, they were struck with wonder. Then, considering him a Vaishnava, they gave him a nice reception. 252. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu could understand that the Tattvavadis were very proud of their Vaishnavism. He therefore smiled and began to speak to them. <clears throat> 253. Considering them very proud, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began his discussion. The chief Acharya of the Tattvavad community was very learned in the revealed scriptures. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu humbly questioned him. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I do not know very well the aim of life and how to achieve it. Please tell me of the best ideal for humanity and how to attain it. 256. The Acharya replied, When the activities of the four castes and the four ashramas are dedicated to Krishna, they can constitute the best means whereby one can attain the highest goal of life. 257. 
when, it, when one dedicates the duties of Varnashram Dharma to Krishna, he is eligible for five kinds of liberation. Thus, he is transferred to the spiritual world in Vaikuntha. This is the highest goal of life and the verdict of all revealed scriptures. Text 258 Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, According to the verdict of the Shastras, the process of hearing and chanting is the best means to attaining devotional loving service to Krishna. Purport According to the Tattvavadis, the best process for achieving the highest goal of life is to execute the duties of the four, four, four varnas and ashramas. In the material world, unless one is situated in one of the varnas, brahmana, kshatriya vaisha, or shudra, one cannot manage social affairs properly to attain the ultimate goal. One has to follow the principles of the ashramas, brahmacharya, grihastha, vanaprastha, and sannyas. Since these principles are considered essential for the attainment of the highest goal, in this way, the tattva bodies establish that the execution of the principles of varna and ashrama for the sake of Krishna is the best way to attain the topmost goal. The tattva bodies thus established their principles in terms of human society. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, however, differed when he said that the best process is hearing and chanting about Lord Vishnu. According to the tattva bodies, the highest goal is returning home back to Godhead. But in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's opinion, the highest goal is attaining love of Godhead. In either of the material world, in either the material world or the spiritual world. In the material world, this is practiced according to Shastric injunction, and in the spiritual world, the real achievement is already there. Text two fifty nine and two sixty. This process entails hearing, chanting, and remembering the holy name, form, pastimes, qualities, and entourage of the Lord, offering service according to the time, place, and performer, worshipping the deity, offering prayers, always considering oneself the eternal servant of Krishna, making friends with him, and dedicating everything unto him. These nine items of devotional service, when directly offered to Krishna, constitute the highest attainment of life. This is the verdict of the revealed scriptures. Purport Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted these verses from Srimad Bhagavatam 7.5 23 through 24. Text 261. When one comes to the platform of loving service to Lord Krishna by executing these nine processes, beginning with hearing and chanting, he has attained the fifth platform of success and the limit of life's goals. Purport Everyone is after success in religion economic development, sense gratification, and ultimately merging into the existence of Brahman. These are the general practices of the common man. But according to the strict principles of the Vedas, the highest attainment is to rise to the platform of Shravanam Kirtanam, hearing and chanting about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Congratulations of, of, of everyone, to everyone on this uh, call. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam 112. Dharma prochita kaitavotra paramo nirmatsaranam satam vedyam bastavam atra bastu shivadam tapa trayon mulanam Srimad Bhagavate mahamune krite kim va parayar ishvara sadyo ridyavarudyatetra Kriti B. Shushu Shubis Takchanat. Completely rejecting 
all religious activities which are materially motivated, this Bhagavad Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Sri Vyasadeva, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of the Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established with, within his heart. This verse of Srimad Bhagavatam rejects as cheating processes all religious activities that aim at achieving materialistic goals, including dharma, artha, kama, and even moksha, or liberation. According to Sridhar Swami, the material conception of success, moksha, or liberation, is desired by those in material existence. Devotees, however, not being situated in material existence, have no desire for liberation. A devotee is always liberated in all stages of life because he is always engaged in the nine items of devotional service, shravanam, kirtanam, etc. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy holds that devotional service to Krishna always exists in everyone's heart. Shall I repeat that again? Thank you. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy holds that devotional service to Krishna always exists in everyone's heart. It simply has to be awakened by the process of Shavanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu. Shavanadi Shutta Chitti Karaye Udai, CC Madhya 22 107. When a person is actually engaged, in devotional service. His eternal relationship with the Lord, the servant-master relationship, is awakened. And I'm going to stop there. It's after 8 o'clock and I feel compelled in my heart to uh, answer the call that Vaisheshika Prabhu uh, made to me and he's waiting for my call. So. Abhaya is waiting for any reflections that are coming from the exalted sages who have been very, very tolerant today. Thank you very much. And Srila uh, Bhaktivedanta Thakur Ki Jai. Single-handedly, Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur reawakened the Krishna consciousness all over India, especially in Bengal and Orissa, which are supposed to be the seats of Krishna consciousness, especially in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, single-handedly. So we owe everything to him. We dedicate this reading and our lives to him through the auspices of our dear, most, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, Kinjari. Okay. What's going on over there? <clears throat> They're all so lovely. They're reciprocating with me <clears throat> because they know that I want to call Vaisheshika Prabhu back. That's what I'm tasting. That's what I'm thinking. The relationship between me and them is very deep and very confidential. Hare Krishna. And very loving. Okay, Yudutama. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Gurudev. Please accept my humble obeisances and all glories to Sri the Prabhupada. All glories to His Divine Grace, Sri the Prabhupada. All glories to Bhakti Vinod Thakur. 
Why did the Tattvavadis think that Lord Chaitanya was a Mayavadi? Because he took sannyas from Keshava Bharati and therefore he, he followed some of the external rituals of the Mayavad uh, Sampradaya. Um, but on the other hand, when they heard him and saw him, they understood he was a Vaishnava. So we shouldn't take, think mistakenly that he took uh, initiation. He did take initiation in the uh, Mayavad line from Shankaracharya, from Keshava Bharati. And we heard about these lines of authority in one of the purports before. And we shouldn't, we, could, we shouldn't neglect the importance of Shankaracharya or the Sampradaya that he, he followed because he had a purpose. You know, his devotional service to Krishna. Krishna gave him a direct instruction. And who was he? Lord Shiva. So Shankaracharya was actually an incarnation of Lord Shiva. And he was instructed by Krishna himself to come and preach the Mayavad philosophy in order to reinvigorate the faith of the people of India in the Vedic literatures. Because previous to that, the Buddhists had come and undermined the faith of the people of India in the Vedic scriptures and taught a principle of meditation that depended just on one's own uh, activity. So then, because everyone had become accustomed to the teachings of Buddha, which is, which is called uh, Shunyavad, or uh, void philosophy, uh, Buddha taught that there was no God, but because he was actually an incarnation of Krishna, pretty tricky, this Krishna, it's not so easy to understand Krishna. He, he taught an atheistic philosophy, Shunyavad, the, in which the goal was void conception, uh, an annihilation of all uh, forms and etc., material forms, and therefore people lost faith in the Vedas, because he also taught that the Vedas were uh, written by men. You remember before when Lord Chaitanya met the Buddhists? Uh, that was what they explained. That was one of the nine principles of Buddhism. So, of course, uh, Shankaracharya, Lord Shiva, came in the form of Shankaracharya to teach that no, there is a God but he has no form. Monism, pure monism. But reestablishing the faith in the Vedas, he taught from the Vedanta Sutra, which is a summary study of all the Upanishads, uh, written by Vyasadeva. But he interpreted them in such a way as to indirectly say that Vyasadeva was mistaken I mean, that's a very deep subject. I don't have time now to explain all the intricacies of that philosophy. But suffice it to say that Srila Prabhupada uh, commented that of the two, uh, the Shunyavad, or the Buddhist philosophy, and the Nirvishesh, the impersonal or Mayavad philosophy of, of Shankaracharya, the Shankaracharya's philosophy is more dangerous because it says, yes, there is God, but he's formless. And therefore, they make offense. It's offensive against Vishnu and Krishna. Uh, so, because the Tattvavadis were in the line of Madhvacharya, and Madhvacharya came after uh, Shankaracharya, and they taught, and he was also an incarnation of Vayu, 
the Lord of the, the demigod in charge of the air, the wind. Uh, and he was very powerful, as we heard in the previous uh, commentary. Um, and he was very forceful in his um, preaching against the Mayavad philosophy. And as we heard, the seat of the Mayavad philosophy, the Shingari Mat, their leader was soundly defeated by Madhvacharya. So this is a historical ser sequence of events that must be understood in the context of, the, of a broader length of time and what the purpose of the Lord was for all of these uh, appearances of the great uh, Acharyas. Uh, first Buddha appeared to teach nonviolence and to stop the animal killing that was being done rampantly on the plea of the, of the authority of the Vedas. Therefore, Buddha negated the authority of the Vedas in the minds of the people. And then Shankaracharya reestablished the Vedas as authoritative, but taught the, the goal was impersonal, and that uh, God was without form. And therefore, by implication, Krishna, who has form, was also a product of Maya, a product of illusion. Therefore, they're called Maya Vadis. But then Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya came. They were also very powerful uh, 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 some, some stock acharyas, founder of the reawakening of the four, two of the four um, um, authorized disciplic successions that go back to the Adi Gurus, uh, Lakshmi, um, Lord Brahma, uh, Lord Shiva, and the four Kumaras. So, therefore, when Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, he did it for these reasons. First of all, Shankaracharya's philosophy and, and teachers and teaching and his representatives were everywhere. That's the first point. Second point is that Lord Chaitanya had a plan. He wanted to take sannyas at a particular time. At that time, his spiritual master, Ishwara Puri, was not physically present in the area. And so, was he still alive then? I, yes, he was. Actually, I can't remember the actual dates. But anyway, and therefore, when Kesha Bharti came, that's one level of understanding. But the another level of understanding, uh, confirmed by the uh, Ganudesh Deepika, Gora Ganudesh Deepika, Kabi Kanapur, is that Kesha Babarti was actually Sandipani Muni in Krishna Lila. So there was another level of pastime going on here where they met again and he accepted uh, sannyas from him. But he did take the trappings. He, he carried a danda, uh, an ekadanda, and he shaved off his shika. And, or he didn't keep a shika, rather, and Brahman's thread, because that's what the Mayavadis do. So because he looked externally like a Mayavad philosopher, therefore he was able to be accepted in places where the Mayavad philosophers were accepted. But uh, those even Mayavad philosophers could tell that he was a Vaishnava by his actions by his activities. He was always chanting and dancing and hearing the scriptures. As, had he, as he just explained to the tattva bodies that this is the actual goal of life. Because the tattva bodies think that Varnasham following the rules strictly, offering the results to Krishna for his pleasure, uh, take one back to Vaikuntha, and there they achieve the perfection of life. But Lord Chaitanya's understanding of the perfection of life was to attain the taste for, in love 
and separation from Krishna by hearing and chanting uh, the, the glories of the Lord here in this material world. So you can achieve the goal of life even in this material world. But the top bodies think you have to go to the spiritual world to attain the goal of life. So that's a little exposition. We should never disrespect Shankaracharya in the sense that he is an incarnation of Shiva. He was acting on behalf or on the order of Lord Krishna and was doing something temporary in order to bridge a gap between Buddhism and the uh, proper understanding of the philosophy of the Vedas from the Acharyas in the Va Vaishnava Sampradaya. And we just heard the Sampradaya all the way from Vyasadeva through Madhvacharya. And there were no Mayavadis in that Sampradaya. So Madhavendra Puri appeared in that Sampradaya. Lord Chaitanya is in that Sampradaya also, even though he appeared uh, appeared to take sannyas from a Mayavadi, sannyasi, he was initiated by Ishwara Puri, who was a disciple of, of uh, Madhavendra Puri. This was a preaching technique of Lord Chaitanya, actually. It allowed him to sit among the sannyasis, you know, in Varanasi, and deliver them all to Vaishnavism. Prakashananda Saraswati Thakur also recognized that he was a Vaishnava by his activities, but he looked like a Mayavadi. So he was always saying, why are you doing this? You should come with us and study the Vedanta. And the same thing happened with Sarvabhava Bhattacharya. Anyway, that's just a little historical analysis. And I'm going to go now. Don't, don't mind anybody who's holding. Are there other comments? Yeah. Hare Krishna, go ahead. So, uh, Yudhutama says, Hare Krishna, thank you for your very thorough answer. <clears throat> you mentioned the intricacies of Mayavad philosophy a few times and comment that it takes a while to go into the details. Is this, is this information we should be familiar with? Yeah, it's, you just read the seventh chapter of the Adi Lila. And there the intricacies of the Mayabad philosophy and how it is defeated is thoroughly explained. And also the fifth chapter, uh, but especially the seventh chapter of Adi Lila, it's there, it, complete. Hare Krishna. And there's something from Rati Manjari also. Yeah. But you have to be careful. If you study the Mayavad philosophy, it should only be in order to defeat it. Because if you don't, if you hear Mayavad philosophy uh, submissively, then your spiritual life is doomed. That is the conclusion of Lord Chaitanya, which is proof that he wasn't a Mayavadi, even though he took that uh, sannyas in that sampradaya. Um, uh, Rati Manjari says, probably due to my neophyte condition, I still find it a little bit uncomfortable to hear in detail how much about all this Mayavad philosophy has been established. It's another reason to me why I need to hear from you and Sri the Prabhupada to get the complete Vaishnava understanding, even of the need for Shankaracharya's philosophy to rise. Could we take from this that the Lord is very patient but determined to lay down his plan to reclaim all his children and bring us to the highest level by coming as Lord Chaitanya? Yes. Absolutely. Well said. These different sampradayas, except for the four main sampradayas, they have their 
time and circumstance purposes. And they're meant to be transitional. But the nature, because of the nature of the material world, whenever anything enters, even if it's illusory, it stays in time because some people accept it and they pass it on to others. Therefore, you will still, still see, even though the Buddhists were firmly uh, kicked out of India, even though the Mayavad philosophy was firmly defeated by Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, still it goes on because that's the nature of the world. Therefore, it takes transcendental intelligence. And you get that transcendental intelligence by hearing submissively from liberated soul in the Vaishnava Sampradaya. Hare Krishna. So now with your permission, all of you, thank you very much for your lovely questions and comments, realizations, reflections. Now I'm going to go and call Vajashika Prabhu because I've been waiting to talk to him for weeks, well, a few weeks, and uh, I need to talk to him. Important. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai Samabheda Bhakta Brinda Ki Jai Gaur Prem Anandi Hari Hari Bo See you tomorrow and glories to Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, the father of our separate, of our mission. Um, see you tomorrow night, same time, same place, same subject. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Hare